Any you have questions for us or no? <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, I I may look like I'm offending you, but uh, one of our friends is trying to figure out how we're getting Euro Cup tickets tomorrow. So I'm like messaging back and forth with them. So if I'm doing if I'm on here, we're just messaging back and forth. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, how, just a quick question. How long does it take from the initial start to investment in terms of vent first venture investment, not seed investment, but venture investment? So in terms of like diligence, like first meeting to actual dollars yeah, in? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It can, it can vary, okay? So yeah, I know. Uh, by a lot. Um, I'll, I'll just give you the fastest one that I've ever done was Yammer, actually. From first meeting to um, like a signed term sheet, maybe like ten days, okay. and money wired in twenty days, like th thirty, you know, maybe five weeks total from you know front to end, and it was a big check uh -huh. um, with all kinds of legal diligence and all that stuff. So, um, and then there's companies that, you know, I would say like my previous firm, we did a lot of like hardware investing, semiconductor, clean tech, a lot of like deep science where there's a lot of diligence involved and lots of like subject matter experts who can visit and meet and those things can take six months yeah. you know and um, I, I tend to not invest in those things anymore so and in terms of like internet services basically pretty simple stuff yeah I mean it, you know we should have a point of view on the market and understand the metrics pretty quickly so um, you know it shouldn't take more than a couple weeks to a month to figure it out whether you want to invest or not. Okay, thanks. But the fundraising process can take a long time. And so mm -hmm. we've had companies that have almost taken a year to finally close uh, a round of financing. Sometimes they're seeing investors and then uh, they got to change the game plan because the product's not working. Uh, even with us, our, our past company, Lafora, it took us around eight months or something. And so sometimes it takes a while. So don't be discouraged if uh, a few initial meetings don't go well. Uh, I can have one. Is is there a question there? Sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know that. I mean, uh, right. So there's different types of investments, right? Like Series A is like you know you put a valuation on the company and then you're basically uh, selling equity. Um, but uh, you know, an an alternative approach is uh, what angel investors use, which is uh, convertible notes, which most of you guys probably know. But that is a much more lightweight approach. It's much faster, cheaper. Um, and simpler, right? So the legal work involved is usually pretty simple. I think you can probably close one of those in a day because all it takes is you just like, you know, sign the convertible note, you can email it over, and then you can wire the money the next day. So it's a nice, cheap, uh, and fast alternative. So I have another one. Uh, the fundraising process. Yeah, I've been to Silicon Valley. We talked. I don't know if you remember that. I don't know if I'm memorable enough. Anyway, um, I, I found out that, <laughs> yeah, uh, answer yes. Uh, I found out the mm, fundraising process, it can take a while, as you mentioned, but it also is a science in itself. Uh, I've been talking to mm, people from Y Combinators, from, uh, from some other accelerators, and they told me that, uh, well, th they are trying to close around with uh, several investors or several uh, angel investment uh, angels. So, I don't think we see here in Poland or maybe in Central Europe uh, that kind of uh, group investment. Um, what do you think is that? People, I think part of the problem here is that there's just not as many investors here, right? So when you go out there in the United States and you go out there and like raise like a syndicated series, I mean a syndicated angel round, I mean you go out there and I will introduce my companies to 60 angel investors and they'll get you know 30 replies and they'll have like 20 meetings within a week, right? And they'll plow through those meetings of those 20 that will get you know five six people interested and they have a syndicated round here in poland how many angels investors are there i, I don't know i mean like i know a couple of the guys and i don't think there's a, a, a large enough concentration so for you guys you have to go out there and be a little bit more strategic you should do like a you know meeting of week of meetings here in poland all in, you know very closely then maybe london then maybe a week or two in san francisco so you have that kind of short window uh, kind of time frame but maybe you do it across different markets but uh you guys have to plan even more because in Silicon Valley I could be like my company say hey Paul I need some intros <laughs> intros go out 
and then all of a sudden they got meetings the next day, right? You guys have to kind of plan before, and and you have to also be showing up more often too, and kind of you know bringing awareness to your company as well too. It's like you're raising always because you're even if you're not raising the money, you're kind of gaining awareness, you're building a relationship, and then when you're ready to kind of you know go for it, then you're gonna go for it and say, hey guys, it's time, right? And it kind of has that whole forcing function of sorts. Okay, so it's it will it will just I figure take time here in uh, Central Europe or even Europe. Uh, to grow the angel or VC base, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a question of it's just an amount of of investors, right? I mean, it, it helps to have more. I mean, the more because like, let me give a perfect example. This is one company. Um, they've gone through a few pivots also. But like when they first went out to raise money, they talked to a hundred, I think five or six investors that said no, every single one. But the hundred sixth investor gave them a million dollar check, literally within like a day or two. Sometimes you just got to talk to enough people, like you know, that believe in you. Like I, I forget, was Javid said like. Or somebody said, like, you know, you don't necessarily have to convince an investor. You have to be aligned with them, and they believe in you, right? So sometimes you just have to talk to enough people till you find the one guy who's like, oh, my God, I worked on this 10 years ago. This problem is still bugging me. I want to work on it, right? So, yeah, the numbers game hurts. I mean, you should also all along be evolving your pitch. Like, these guys went through 100 invest- I mean, they're constantly were changing their pitch. They're constantly taking the feedback until they kind of found the right magical, you know, combination. But um, you should not give up. I mean, you you never know what may be around the corner, but you want to do this as, as quick of a time frame as possible. You don't want to drag this on for two years, right? I mean, these guys, they, made, they had all these meetings. They did them very, very quickly uh, because they were very kind of organized and they kind of lined up meetings very, very, you know, kind of diligently. Y- y- yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm from uh, Wisdio and we raised in uh, Poland in uh, Angel Round, uh, uh, two hundred thousand dollars from uh, eight investors, and uh, it, it, yes, it worked out. So, so, yeah. Uh, one thing is, uh, you have to talk to different perspectives. Yesterday, Don Dodge said, "Avoid healthcare and avoid education." You know, and you know, I, th- I think that's really important. That successful people are not identical, and and you know, I was saying, well, the bigger the the he was talking about the government being such a big factor and therefore you should avoid it. So, and one thing is you have to find people who are compatible because also you have to hang out with people a lot. If you're, you don't want to hang out with investors who you, who you don't like, you know, it's not worth taking the money if you don't get on with them, I think. I definitely had experiences where I've taken money from people I didn't, didn't like and I knew I didn't like them actually, but I was so desperate, I had to take the money, right? And it was a painful relationship for like many years, right? Um, so yeah, y- you want to avoid people. You like it's magical moments when you sit down with an investor or somebody, and you're like, "This person makes sense." I feel like him. He. I mean, a lot of times us guys when we're investing, I mean, we're, we're doing some calculations. We're looking at the market, but a lot of times it's gut, and the gut comes down to what the personal kind of chemistry is, right? So yeah, I mean, you want to be around people you enjoy, and but you know, sometimes you have to take a hit for the team. But I'd av- I'd avoid it as much as you can. But you know, at the end of the day, still the jobs. The CEO's job is to keep the company alive and there's my said to raise money. So if that's all you could get, it's the only thing that's on the table, take it, but otherwise avoid it. <laughs> right? So yeah. Don't do what I did. I'm an idiot. So yeah. Okay, Ma- Mamun, you, uh, you said that you have one investment in the Polish company and that it's uh, sort of like an accidental investment. Uh, what is your actual attitude towards investing in a, a faraway place like Poland. I mean, you know, if a if a CEO of a startup comes up to you after this talk and says, you know, I've got this great startup, I mean, are you going to sort of groan and pretend that you're interested, or in fact, uh, uh, w- what is your go- you know wh- what are you going to be your requirements, right? Are you going to be figuring out how to move them uh, ten miles from yourself um, fast so it so it makes sense for you, or or what? Yeah. So uh, the the company that I invested in, um, I actually have never met the Polish guys. So I'm meeting him this this evening. So uh, the CEO is the one uh, that I spend a lot of time with and uh, before investing in the company. Um, what he exhibited was that he had, you know, the, the product was already great and the customers we spoke to said it was great. So, um, which made me believe that the, the technology was great and uh, it was gonna scale with, with the usage and the growth of the, the user base. So um, it was accidental. You know, exactly. It was accidental. Um, th- I would talked earlier about how the bar is higher. Uh, in this case, we got comfortable because you know the CEO was in fact in the U.S. and uh, he's in Chicago, where the team is actually only three people, and 
Um, my guess is eventually he does move to Silicon Valley because he knows that that's where um, a company like his should be built, most likely. So if a CEO was to come up to me right now, um, it would have to have some sort of traction because uh, it's hard to foster like that relationship that you need to, you know, very early on in a company's history where there's zero traction and it's just a product and an idea. Um, it's hard to do far away, uh, and we work very closely. I work very closely with those with the companies that I sort of seed invest or do like a very early stage investment in, uh, where there's no product and it's a just a great idea. Or uh, so anything that we would I would do is probably would require some sort of meaningful traction before I'd invest in a far off place. I mean, so actually for us, 20% of our investments are abroad. Um, and I mean, I'm very open internationally. I mean, I'm here because I want to hear and listen to what you guys are working on and stuff like that. No, I mean, I, I've, been, I've been to Poland many times before. I actually had a team of about 40 people working for me here in Krakow and Gliwice back in the day. Um, but I mean, like Mamun mentioned a little bit earlier, any team from anywhere in the world, whether it's Poland, whether it's Malaysia, whether it's you know Uzbekistan, um, they have to be just that much better. So if there's like a Silicon Valley company and then there's like another company from Poland, if they're the exact same quality, I'm going to pick the U.S. company because it's just so much more easier. Like these guys, you, know, you guys have to be that much more better. And I'm sorry, that's the truth. And I wish you guys the best luck because, I mean, there's a lot of talent here. But you have to be just that much more better and that much more remarkable to get money from a U.S. investor, right? And that's the honest truth, right? Because we do want to make our lives easier too, right? And I don't want to worry about all this crazy convoluted tax laws here and all that type of shit, right? So, um, yeah, you guys have to be just that much better. And that's the reality. But can you do it? Of course. It's just going to be a little bit more work. Or you guys have to just kind of struggle for a little bit longer and get along farther. But I must say some of the uh, entrepreneurs that I have invested in that are, that are international are some of the most impressive people I know because I know they had to struggle way much more than somebody equivalent in the United States. And to that, you know, my hat's off to those guys. They're really amazing. Okay, uh, you have mentioned that you prefer uh, companies, enterprise uh, software that is easy to test, that you can simply sign up for it, uh, play it for a month, and uh, decide whether it's cool or not. It happens that we are making business-to-business uh, -business, uh, software that requires some diligence, uh, requires some time to implement. Uh, when I met Paul first, he said that uh, I'm in deep shit because uh, you ha we'll have to go from one company to another and it will take time. What would be your advice? Is it? Um yeah, I think you know a company like that does require. Are are you guys funded by anything? Are you bootstrapping it? Yeah, bootstrapping. Okay. And um, you know how long have you been around? It's uh, 2009, uh, the end of the 2009. And you have a product that you can now um, beta with the customer? Yeah, we are in a close beta with Kabam, for example. Okay, with a, a few customers? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, are you just facing the pain right now? I mean, you, you haven't paid yourself in a long time. and So it's uh, the process, of course, uh, takes time to uh, get there. but There's no sh shortcut there. Yeah, so there is no shortcut. <laughs> there is no shortcut. In, okay. in those kind of companies, there is no shortcut. Um, and what makes Silicon Valley easier for a company like that is, one is you can get potentially seed funded um, and uh, have enough to ride out like those long customer trials or going. And the other thing is that you have a lot of customers who will try out your product because they're early adopters on technology. Uh, maybe you know half a dozen Silicon Valley companies would want to use your product. Um, and you can go talk to them. You can go help implement it with them. You can send one of your engineers over and help them Im implement it. So accelerate that, ho that whole process. And time is money in, in your business. And not just like making money, but like you're going without raising money. So it's money out of your own pocket. So it, it, you know that's why enterprise companies are sometimes hard to build from sort of far off places or like not where the customers are because it just takes that much longer to go visit the customer than to beta it with them, than to guide them through the process of, of actually implementing it and then s saying, yes, it works. So, uh, But there's no shortcuts, though. Okay, so uh, this basically means that I have to be there. You have to persevere through it. Yeah. And, you know, successful companies, successful software companies that sell to B2B, B2B enterprise companies have come, come about, and they've, there's plenty of them out there that have just been bootstrapped and they get their first you know 
half a million dollar customer and that's it, you know, and then you can go from there. Then, you know, you can get your next half a million dollar customer and you're a, a million dollar revenue company and, and you've got enough to support 10 engineers and then you get your next five, you know, so it, it can work. I mean, it's just that, you know, you want to identify the first right customer and so that you can get that big deal because if you're doing something that's meaningful and takes time to implement and build, it, it probably means that it's software that has a high price point. Is that true? That's true. True, right? So, uh, if it's got a high price point, you know, how quickly can you get that first customer in the door? Um, and and choosing your customer wisely is very important then, or choosing the market or the sub segment, the vertical for your software is very important. Like, what market segment do you want to sell into first? It's a uh, gaming uh, game analytics. Game analytics, right? So, so you said Zynga is your? Uh, no, it's Kabam. Kabam, kabam, okay. Um, eh, yeah, so that's great. I mean, so you should talk to other game. I'm sure you are. Yeah. And how big of a deal can you, if it works, how much do you think they'll pay you? It's it's hard to say because we are before the uh, final say that what is the price point for this. But this is, uh, it c in different, different uh, verticals, the deals are half a million dollars. So it's... Uh, for e-commerce, so mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, so it's great. I mean, so get through this phase. <laughs> yeah. that's, <it>. <laughs> <laughs> that's advice that I lead, really like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go do it. Uh, how important are incubators in the whole uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem? And Mamun, how many companies did you invest that were in incubators at the seed stage? Let's see. Um, yeah, two from these guys. We're just doing one right now uh, that these guys just incubated. And, and then one I did when I was at my previous firm, USUP, uh, again, uh, with these guys. And then I've done one Y Combinator deal uh, over the last five years. Um, but a lot of, it seems like even we did another company recently that had some initial funding from 500 startups. So it seems like a fair amount, uh, even though they already probably had some sort of idea before they went into the accelerator. Um, the accelerator probably gave them more confidence and, you know, some skills and some relationships, um, to help them raise their, their money. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so is it is it um, majority of companies? No, not majority. I would say like less than a third, less yeah, than twenty okay. percent. And is the importance of incubators growing over the last couple of years? I'd say it's leveling off. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd agree. I mean, e I run an incubator, right? And but I mean, the best entrepreneurs, honestly, like some of the really most amazing ones. They don't need incubators, right? I think incubators really come into play when somebody is either a first-time entrepreneur or they're coming from the outside and they're not connecting to Silicon Valley or they just need that final push, right? But I didn't need an incubator. Java didn't need an incubator. A lot of these guys don't need incubators, right? Um, so it really depends on your personal style. But it's definitely a shortcut, and you have to kind of balance it. Like, how much is my time worth versus how much equity I want to give up, right? Because, you know, you come through and you save tons of time. You build these connections, and, like, if you're an entrepreneur, Shit. Um, <laughs> if you're an entrepreneur and you're, you know, running a company, and all of a sudden next week you're sitting down with some amazing entrepreneurs who would have taken you two or three years to get to, sometimes it pays off big time. And and I, I really believe it's big, especially if you're coming from outside Silicon Valley, either your other parts of the United States or even from abroad, and you get into an incubator. It really kind of, well, it accelerates you through the process, right? So yeah. Yeah. Certain companies also fit the model well. Uh, obviously, if you're building a, a very big product that involves multiple years, maybe it's not going to be the best place for you. Um, but if you're almost at that final stage of the product or it's a very easy product to build uh, and you can have something done within three months, it really works well. Any more questions? Hello? Okay. Yep. In your opinion, how important are patents at the investment stage? Should we uh, should we focus on on uh, um, applying for them? Yeah. Or 
focus on business. I think all three of us will say patents suck. Who gives a shit? Start building your product. Um, get it out the door. Because, I mean, did Facebook have a patent? No. They went out and bought it seven years later, right? Did Yelp have a patent? No. If you go out there and you build an amazing product and you execute on it, you could always buy it later or it becomes irrelevant of sorts. So. Oh, I have 10 more minutes. Okay, cool. Okay, I, I wasn't sure if we were being kicked out. But, um, yeah, so I, I'd say patents, don't worry about it. I think it's a waste of time, waste of money. And, I mean, that's in like consumer internet kind of enterprise stuff. If you're doing like some crazy biotech stuff, okay, patents might be important. But in our respective spaces that we invest in, if somebody tells me they spent all this money on a patent, I'm like, that money's just wasted. So um, that's, I think, I think that would probably all of our answer, right? Yeah. I mean, there are definitely areas where patents matter and, you know, uh, material science, biotech, pharma, you know, medical devices, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? So, but there's in software, patents are quite meaningless. Okay, thanks. Um, in terms of all the investments that you actually made already, uh, how many of the companies did you actually seek out yourself and how many did actually come specifically to you for investments? I would say, you know, a, a lot of them. Because the, I'm asking because there's competition on both sides. So there's yeah, yeah. competition between the VCs and there's competition between the startups themselves. So Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd say more than half were introductions came to us. More than half. Maybe even like close to 70% okay. were somehow... Someone had heard about us, you know, wanted to talk to me or someone else, you know. So I would say it's a, there's a few times where you really like a company and you really want to seek them out. Um, that's, I would say, a more rare occasion. Usually, even if you like a company, you'll reach out to someone that knows the company and that's how you seek them out. Uh, but I'd say over half, they're coming to you. Else may be coming to you like you. They met up with you long term, like a while ago. Then they just meet up with you later on when they have something at that stage where they want to invest money in you, right? Yeah. And so for us, every single one's inbound. So we have an actually open application process. Anybody in the world can apply to, and yeah, so everything comes in our front door, and then we kind of filter it down from there. So we are very open in that way. We've had a couple we have to recruit, but overall, yeah, yeah. Is it like? Yeah, with to convince them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a quite a general question, which is about where you get your information from, because we're all drowning in information, and there are these. I quite often find people think that if they get onto TechCrunch, they've kind of made it, and somehow, I'm not sure that's. I think it's very impressive to get onto TechCrunch, but where do you go to get the to get your information from, <laughs> uh, be careful. You know, it's valuable sprint. You know, uh, yeah. So yeah. So the question is, like, what websites do you visit every day? What blogs do you read? I read Twitter a lot, and pretty much rely on my friends to kind of retweet cool stuff. I don't read TechCrunch anymore. Actually, I think it's kind of almost too much information in TechCrunch. Um, like two, three years ago, I read every single day, and I totally loved it. But now it's just way too much. So I just kind of. Check Twitter, or, or I just kind of hear through a grapevine. I do so many meetings a day, like people kind of interesting things come up in the meetings. It's almost like a passively coming to me because I have really great friends I trust to kind of know what's going going on and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Twitter, Twitter's good. Uh, I, I I still do read TechCrunch. I enjoy it, but uh, there are there are some good articles that that come through from Twitter that are from other sources that are really enjoyable too. Um, so yeah, I still read TechCrunch. Um, Twitter's great. Um, but just like Paul and, and Dan, I'm sure, uh, have so many meetings in a day uh, that you hear about things from entrepreneurs. And if you hear about them twice, you, you, you're like, oh, okay, I heard that one. Three times you start to lock in on it. And you're like, okay, I got to focus on this. There's, there must be something here. And then also a great place is uh, board meetings. Um, you hear a lot from, um, your, or from your CEOs. Your, this, our CEOs are plugged in. And they hear about, you know, they get young CEOs want to talk to more experienced CEOs about how to build their business. And so I hear a lot through, uh, you know, uh, portfolio companies as well. 
Uh, if you if you found a company outside of the U.S., uh, do you expect the team to move to U.S. Uh, sooner or later? For us, we always uh, recommend that they do, uh, just because it makes always the the later stage VCs uh, more comfortable. But if you have a good development team here, uh, it maybe makes sense. If you have an entertainment company, it makes sense to go to Los Angeles. If you're doing ad agencies or ad networks, New York is going to make sense. Um, but if you could just build a product in your home country, you make I don't see a reason why not to. Uh, there's a lot of cultural issues too. Yeah, I mean, I think if a company is a well-oiled machine that's running, then there's no reason for it to move them. Um, and there are situations where, you know, there's, I think of a company like Atlassian that's in Australia, really good company, I, you know, for many years running, um, you know, they run the, have a co product called Jira and Confluence and very successful company. But actually even, even they in the last few years have ramped up their Silicon Valley office pretty rapidly. Um, but I don't think they were expected to move. So like Rovio, I think it's still Finland based, you know. So there are circumstances where a company is just running so well in their home countries or wherever they were founded, there's no reason to move them. But if it, if there's still like execution risk involved, then um, uh, you know I would encourage them to move as well. Any other questions? Okay, so it's the last one. Um, just what, one quick question. Um, what do you guys think about uh, AngelList? Is that a good platform for contacting investors outside of uh, outside of the US? So, for example, if we're a company from Poland, then we set up a profile, uh, we get connected, and so on. AngelList is really good in, if you use it the right way. Uh, just as far as, as a source of information, it's awesome. Uh, but for raising around um it's it's best to at least have some money already uh committed because then it makes it a lot easier for these kind of angels that maybe in other locations to see oh, okay he's already got five hundred thousand uh committed but if you're like at zero funded and you're looking for one million it's gonna be hard to find that lead uh, that's my opinion angelus is 100 percent momentum play so people that do really well there yeah they go on there and say i have three or four angels already committed and then it gets blasted out to hundreds of people. Those angels also blast it out to their various networks. And then it helps kind of close the round. It's almost like a forcing function. Like, oh, shit, they're going out. Oh, okay, so angels sometimes have to kind of make their decisions way more quicker. But as Dan said, if you go in there with zero and you put a profile up there, crickets are going to be chirping because no one cares. There's so many companies being listed in angels. And actually, it's only accelerating. So you have to go in there and kind of really, yeah, kind of have something already moving for you. So that's... Why we encourage people to do a lot of in individual meetings, and then we kind of go out there and put them on Angelus. But it's a tool that me and all my companies use for sure because it helps kind of go out there and get the final funding in. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So thank you.